A man perished in a fire in Pomona, but did he do it as an act of suicide in a domestic dispute? And charged for 1.3 tons of cocaine, but the accused got free today, we'll tell you how. And after three days without, finally, new COVID information is released. Also, when will the food pantry program resume? No answers for tens of thousands. We've got details of these and other stories in our newscast for tonight, Thursday, December 3rd, 2020. Good evening. With your news, I'm Indora Crank. Christmas want to remember with a no hassle loan from Quickstop. Starting November 20th, all first time customers automatically qualify for a $500 cash advance. Returning customers get double their last loan offer. Visit your nearest Quickstop branch or apply online at quickstoponline.com. Quickstop Personal Finance Center. No hassle loans. safe by stopping the spread of germs that can make us sick. Remember to wash your hands often, especially after using your devices for toys and before and after eating. If you don't have soap and water, use a hand sanitizer. Make sure to put it all over your hands, front and back, and let it dry. Don't wipe it off. Believe Electricity Limited. We care about your safety. Kira Finello. I'm 37 years young. I was born in Belize City and I moved around a lot until I settled here in Belmopan. My day sometimes starts from like 5.30 in the morning because I would get up to go run. But during that period of time, that's when I got my thoughts. Being a mother of two and a wife and an employer, you know, it's hard finding a balance to juggle everything. But we love what we do, so it's worth it. I'm technically a second generation insurance agent. My grandmother was in the industry for over 40 years and uh, in 2015 she was diagnosed with cancer. And it's because of her encouragement and the support of the RFNG team I decided to continue her legacy. I saw the love she had for what she did and the love she had for her customers because it wasn't just about providing a service, but it was about creating friendship. I am your neighbor, I am your friend, I am your RFNG agent. Find your nearest RFNG agent on our website at rfginsurancebelize.com, where it pays to get it right. Stay safe and submit your sickness benefit claim form electronically. Follow these four steps. Step 1. Obtain your medical certificate. At consultation, the doctor certifies your days of illness and provides you with a medical certificate. Step 2. Fill out your sickness benefit form. Complete all the fields in parts 1 to 4 on the front page of the sickness benefit form. Step 3. Request your salaries record form. Contact your employer for your salaries record form. Step 4. Submit your sickness benefit claim form. Scan or take a clear picture of the sickness benefit form, salaries record, and proof of bank account. Email the documents to claims at socialsecurity.org.bz within 14 days. You will receive an email reply confirming receipt of your claim. 
After the submission of all documents, your claim is processed for payment to your account. For any COVID-related illnesses, contact the Ministry of Health for further guidance. Social Security Board, safeguarding you, your family, your future. Everyone is at risk of catching COVID-19, so it's important to quickly recognize signs and symptoms of the infection. The most common symptoms are fever, dry cough, and tiredness or fatigue. Some people may also have sore throat, aches and pains, stuffy nose, or diarrhea. But a few people have also reported pink eye or conjunctivitis, headache, loss of taste or smell, a rash on skin or change in the color of fingers or toes. Emergency warning signs that require immediate medical attention are extreme difficulty breathing, severe constant pain or pressure in the chest, becoming confused, unable to talk or move, bluish lips, face, fingers or toes. For more information, call 0800-MOHCARE. Help keep Belize safe. Tragedy struck in Pomona Village just after nine last night when a wooden structure belonging to 45-year-old Vernon Williams Sr. went up in flames. And by the time the smoke cleared, Williams was found dead, burnt beyond all recognition. But did he plan his own terrible end? This afternoon, Cherise Alsal traveled to Pomona Village to find out how and why the fire was set. 45-year-old Vernon Alexander Williams Sr died last night under mysterious circumstances. Rumors abound that he may have become suicidal due to an ongoing domestic dispute. Williams' family, most of them residents of Pomona Village, collectively decided to refrain from comment. But ahead of that decision, our team managed to speak to his younger brother. He claimed not to know much, but said that Vernon will certainly be missed. My brother. He lost his life last night in a fire. When I reached here last night, the house was already down to ground. And that was it. All I could see was that it was his burned body on the ground. And that's it. Couldn't do nothing else. He was a great mechanic, a refrigeration technician, a welder, electrical, and other stuff. And he was a loving brother to all of us. And it's so sad, but we are going to miss him. But whatever the circumstances of William's death, and one thing's for sure, the fire department had a 12-mile delay in responding. That's because the fire station in Pomona has long been abandoned, leaving fire response teams to be forced to travel all the way from Dangriga. And this afternoon in Belize City, station supervisor Kenneth Mortis told us that the fire may not have been accidental. No, the position where Mr. Vernon's body was found was located off the bed on the floor, but literally in between two windows, which um, posed the question as to why Mr. Vernon didn't try to make an attempt to climb out the window, seeing that the window wasn't burglar barred. We, we have information from our counterparts in Dangriga who stated that just a couple weeks ago, Mr. Vernon was experiencing, or he was talking about depression the state of depression has hit him so hard that my counterpart even went on to say that uh, Mr. Vernon even went on to talk about suicidal attempts. That information which revealed itself today versus the findings that he was in remains of this fire could might have well been a means and ways to take himself out of the situation. We did not find anything to support a malicious act from the outside of the building whereby I'm talking about accelerants used. We did not find any of that from the outside. So we are focusing or narrowing our investigations onto the inside as to determine whether it might have been a fire that he may have purposely set. And there is also some questions about whether his car was independently torched. Yes, um, the car, a Honda Civic, was also destroyed along with the, the said structure. Um, at this moment, we, we had our team out on the scene to try and ascertain exactly where the fire started or how the fire started. Unfortunately, um, 
we, we were lacking sufficient evidence to determine an exact cause of the fire. Hence, until further notice or until the team has exhausted all, all angles, this fire remains as undetermined. An undetermined fire and an undetermined death, whether just an accident or the result of a tortured and broken heart. A final answer may come from Williams's post-mortem. Sharice Halsall, 7 News. Vernon Williams Sr. leaves behind four children, including son Vernon Williams Jr. In September of last year, it made headline news when Belizean law enforcement was able to intercept a drug plane that was carrying 41 bales of cocaine. The cops got the drugs, almost 3,000 pounds, which they eventually destroyed. They ended up in a shootout with some of the persons who they allegedly found near the scene of the illegal landing. They detained everyone who they believed was connected to the trafficking. And even after all that, seven of the eight foreigners who they connected to this transnational smuggling operation walked free yesterday. Those now freed of the cocaine charges include the Ecuadorian 44-year-old Juan Pablo Laria Cruz and six Hondurans, 37-year-old Terencio Mejia Cruz, 64-year-old Jacabi Yodani Mejia Garcia, 52-year-old Carlos Humberto Enriquez Gomez and 31-year-old David No Oliana Disque, 33-year-old Alan Yavani Mejia Cherinos and 52-year-old Norlan Jose Charasco Lopez. In order to appreciate this very surprising outcome, we must take you back to September 9th of 2019 when the incident initially happened. This successful anti-drug operation was a well-planned, well-coordinated effort by the Belize Joint Law Enforcement teams consisting of members from the different security forces. They acted on intelligence that Sunday night that an aircraft had left Venezuela and that it was most likely heading to Belize. Police said that just after midnight, the Joint Law Enforcement team that was dispatched on the coastal road spotted the aircraft flying low. They reported waited for the plane to be properly landed and the engine turned off. The Belizean lawmen then pounced on the traffickers before they realized what was happening. However, they didn't simply surrender. They fired at the enforcement team, which returned fire. Through several of the drug smugglers were injured, the Belizean authorities were able to detain everyone. They then escorted the huge quantity of drugs, the occupants of the plane and the aircraft itself from the landing zone. This case was supposed to be an easy win for police, but unfortunately, their total evidence did not meet the threshold for the DPP's office to successfully prosecute all of the accused persons. So when the case was called up yesterday, the prosecutor informed the chief magistrate that the DPP's office had instructed him to withdraw all charges against seven of the eight accused. Seven News got an opportunity to speak with Dickie Bradley, one of their defense attorneys, about the shocking outcome. That a plane landed in the coastal road, drugs were found, there was shooting, um, several persons were detained, I think about eight or so were actually arrested and charged. The DPP's office went over the files over and over with a fine tooth comb. They sent as I think I understand it, further instructions and directives to gather, fill the gaps in the evidence that was obtained. In the end, as we prepared for case management in front of the chief magistrate, the prosecutor informed the court that for those persons, the evidence would not, what little evidence there was, and when I say little, I'm stretching it. They just pick up people in the vicinity. They shot somebody, they shot another person. Um, the evidence does not exist, okay? And I understand the situation with the police. Had they perhaps been able to be there when the plane actually landed, they could maybe catch whoever come out and so on. They were. They were late and that is not their fault. So yesterday the chief magistrate formally notified the persons that they are free to leave. There is no charge against them. 
Now you also heard her ask myself and the other attorney, Oswald Twist, that what is the situation in regards to the other matter of deporting the persons. When a person is found in the country illegally, there is a procedure and then immigration will charge you for being in our country illegally. But that has a statutory limitation and that has gone. These men have been sitting in our prisons for one year and four months. We, you know, as a lawyer, I have advised my clients that they can sue. There's no evidence against them, they can sue, but listen, they just want to get out of Belize and put all of this bad thing behind them, all right? So that is the situation in regards to that. Inside the courtroom, Chief Magistrate Sharon Fraser told the defendants, quote, based on instructions, the charges are withdrawn against all of you. Because you were in prison, it was not automatic that you were released and sent home. I asked you all to be brought into the city and in courts, so from here, I can tell you officially that charges are withdrawn and that there is nothing else before this court on you all, end quote. She also told the men who had been on remand for 14 months, quote, sorry for all you had to go through, end quote. At this time, only 71-year-old Miguel Cruz Meseguer, who was identified as the pilot of the drug plane, remains in prison on quarantine. He hasn't answered to the charges as yet. What are the latest COVID numbers? Well, that's what everyone has been asking for the past two days. We hadn't gotten new figures since November 30th, breaking a trend that started in April with the publication of comprehensive daily infographics. And they appear nightly on the Director of Health Services Facebook page. But on December 1st, visitors to the page were greeted with this message. We will not be posting the routine infographics tonight as we are currently completing the merging of data to include rapid testing results into the established format. The data from private sector is also now being merged. We will be providing a detailed update tomorrow morning. Well, that detailed report should have come out yesterday morning, but it came out 20 minutes ago. It says that there have been four new deaths and 241 new cases. It provides no other details on the ages or home districts of the deceased. A release says the daily infographic now includes the antigen rapid testing results for COVID-19 starting today, December 3, 2020. The change comes after a terrible November that saw 89 COVID-related deaths, an average of three per day. That one month tally for November is one and a half times the total number of deaths that had been recorded in the seven months between March and October. Sources within the ministry say that the responsibility for compiling the infographic has been taken away from the desk of the Director of Health Services, Dr. Marvin Manzanero. So there was no infographic for the past two days and no food pantries or grocery bags for the past two weeks. The grocery bag program, as it has been rebranded by the new minister in charge, Dolores Balaramas Garcia, has been put on pause since the ministry is trying to reconfigure it. Ten days ago, Balderamas Garcia said it would be suspended for, quote, a couple of days. Here's how she puts it at the time. It'll be a couple of days there. It'll be a couple of days. Please, let me assure you. No, it's not going to be two weeks, three weeks, for a month. Christmas, they come. Wait a second. Christmas, they come and I want me done, done. No? So we, 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 we will do our best. But realizing, of course, that we're in difficult, difficult times. So work with us on that, no? Same thing. It's the same thing. But I, I, this is personal now. And it has been renamed. Grocery bag instead of pantry. That was November 23rd. And according to our best information, it has not resumed. And now those who have depended on the program since its inception are wondering where their next food package will come from. Sources tell us that the ministry has not announced a set date for when it will resume the program, since it seems it is still under review. The pantry program and the food assistance program are social safety net programs instituted by the Barrow administration, but criticized by the PUP for being overly politicized. But while politics is one thing, as many as 45,000 persons were receiving food packages through these programs. We did try and get comment from Balderamas Garcia, who is currently at home with COVID-19. 
Reports say the unemployment relief program has also been put on hold. 42,000 persons are signed up also to that program. We'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll tell you why the UDP's Mike Perifit wanted to get his full pay up until November 16th. Don't go away. alert season is here and we have some great deals for you deals deals and more deals from now up until december 31st enjoy deal alert discounts on our line of paints such as bh paints texture light paints and tropical colors paints deal alert markdowns will also be applied on a wide selection of tiles lights and fans tools appliances and much more and remember, whenever you make a purchase, you get double tickets to enter our cash giveaway draw on December 19th to win $10,000. That's right. It's a deal alert. It's a Venice deal alert. So shop now. Get great deals and your tickets for the chance to win the $10,000 grand prize only at, at Venice. Venice is 60 seconds. Beer of Belize. Let's all work together to be germ busters and keep each other safe by stopping the spread of germs that can make us sick. Remember to wash your hands often, especially after using your devices or toys and before and after eating. If you don't have soap and water, use a hand sanitizer. Make sure to put it all over your hands front and back and let it dry. Don't wipe it off. Believe Electricity Limited. We care about your safety. Apple for Kids is here once again. Have you ordered your apple yet? You can get your red apple. Or you can get yellow apple. Each box is just $110. And it's all for the children of Belize. So call 614-3579 before December the 4th. December 4th? That's the Friday. Hurry and order your apples now. And be Belize, children to Belize. BCE. Belize changing Belize. My name is Kira Pinello. I'm 37 years young. I was born in Belize City and I moved around a lot until I settled here in Belmopan. My day sometimes starts from like 5.30 in the morning because I would get up to go run. But during that period of time, that's when I gather my thoughts. Being a mother of two and a wife and an employer, you know, it's hard finding a balance to juggle everything. But we love what we do, so it's worth it. I'm technically a second generation insurance agent. My grandmother was in the industry for over 40 years and uh, in 2015 she was diagnosed with cancer. And it's because of her encouragement and the support of the Earth and G team I decided to continue her legacy. I saw the love she had for what she did and the love she had for her customers because it wasn't just about providing a service, but it was about creating friendship. 
I am your neighbor. I am your friend. I am your RFNG agent. Find your nearest RFNG agent on our website at rfginsurancebelize.com, where it pays to get it right. Stay safe and submit your sickness benefit claim form electronically. Follow these four steps. Step 1. Obtain your medical certificate. At consultation, the doctor certifies your days of illness and provides you with a medical certificate. Step 2. Fill out your sickness benefit form. Complete all the fields in parts 1 to 4 on the front page of the sickness benefit form. Step 3. Request your salaries record form. Contact your employer for your salaries record form. Step 4. Submit your sickness benefit claim form. Scan or take a clear picture of the sickness benefit form, salaries record, and proof of bank account. Email the documents to claims at socialsecurity.org.bz within 14 days. You will receive an email reply confirming receipt of your claim. After the submission of all documents, your claim is processed for payment to your account. For any COVID-related illnesses, contact the Ministry of Health for further guidance. Social Security Board, safeguarding you, your family, your future. Everyone is at risk of catching COVID-19, so it's important to quickly recognize signs and symptoms of the infection. The most common symptoms are fever, dry cough, and tiredness or fatigue. Some people may also have sore throat, aches and pains, stuffy nose, or diarrhea. But a few people have also reported pink eye or conjunctivitis, headache, loss of taste or smell, a rash on skin, or change in the color of fingers or toes. Emergency warning signs that require immediate medical attention are extreme difficulty breathing, severe constant pain or pressure in the chest, becoming confused, unable to talk or move, bluish lips, face, fingers or toes. For more information, call 0800-MOHCARE. Help keep Belize safe. The voters may have soundly rejected the UDP on November the 11th, but former Attorney General and Minister of National Security Mike Perifi told the new government he still wanted his pay up until November 16th. As Perifit explains, that's because of this clause in the Constitution which says, quote, during the period between the dissolution of the National Assembly and the appointment of a Prime Minister after a general election, the government of Belize shall continue to be administered by the Prime Minister and the other ministers and ministers of state of the government. So, Brisenia was sworn in on the 12th in Bamupan, but Perifit is trying his date, tying that is his date, to when the cabinet was sworn in, four days later on the 16th. He says he has agreed to accept pay calculated up to the 11th November, but says the new government was trying to not pay him at all for the entire month of November. 
Perifit says he wants his pay in full and makes no apologies for it. And keeping it on the new government, last night we told you that no gazette had been printed with the specific assignment of the various government departments under their ministerial portfolios. Well, this morning we received from high-level government functionaries an electronic copy of Government Gazette No. 47, dated November 21st, pages 851 through to 886, 35 pages that details all those portfolio assignments. Great. But while it is dated November 21st, we checked, and it's not included in the Gazette sent out on the 21st. The issue seems to be a printing delay because photos of the ministers have not been made available to affix above each portfolio assignment as is the custom. This one from 2008 is an example. The electronic version sent to us includes no pictures. In other government news, 7 News has learned that the Briseño administration plans the ceremonial opening of the House for December 11th and the first working session on December the 18th. And so while the portfolio assignments are known, one CEO was not known. That's the CEO in the Ministry of Sustainable Development, Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management. Eight days after the other CEOs were named, he has finally been named. Dr. Kenrick Williams assumes the post immediately. He holds a doctorate in natural resources and environmental studies from the National Donghui University in Haolin, Taiwan, and a master's degree in international environmental sustainable development from the National Center University. Dr. Williams is well regarded as a consultant in the industry and will support the efforts of his minister, Orlando Habet. The COVID contagion continues to spread through government departments. Two staff members of the National Youth Cadet Service Corps have tested positive for COVID-19. It's a notification that came via press release today from the Department of Youth Services. The department also confirmed that the Youth Cadet Corps has been closed for sanitization and that its entire staff has been placed on quarantine. And while DYS has been placed on quarantine, the Tax Service Department says it's fully operational. Last night we told you that there were protests in the form of sick-outs and walkouts at the Belize Tax Services Department due to a COVID scare. The Tax Department is denying these claims and say that contrary to what we reported, there have been no COVID deaths at their Orange Walk branch. The employee, Mario Gonzalez, did pass away but not from COVID complications. The tax department also clarified that two staff members tested positive at their Belmopan branch. The staff was sent home and the office was sanitized. The Corazol office was also sanitized after suspected cases surfaced. Three staff members at the Belize City headquarters have also tested positive, all from different sections of the building. Two of those staff members tested positive while in self-isolation and one at work. All staff members who work in the same section of the third patient were sent home and the office sanitized. The staff returned to work today. November 25th saw the launch of 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. While there are organizations such as the National Women's Commission and the Youth Enhancement Services who work tirelessly to raise awareness about domestic violence, they can't be in the kitchens and the bedrooms when violence erupts. Courtney Menzies takes a look back at some of the women who have become victims to their violent partners. A woman somewhere in the world has just been beaten by her husband. It was not the first time he has done it, and it probably won't be the last. She is thinking to herself that she needs to escape the relationship, but does not know how. Perhaps this woman is your coworker, or your neighbor, or even your sister. Perhaps she didn't survive the abuse. This is the reality of many women in Belize. Most recently, a 28-year-old mother of one was found partially nude at a dump site in San Pedro Tong. Her body bore a single gunshot wound to the head. The prime suspect, her husband, who had a licensed firearm in his possession. Any idea why Ms. Marcella is dead today, sir? Well, that is something that we are trying to ascertain from the husband who is being interviewed at this time. The husband is a king. He, are you able to say if he's a firm suspect in what transpired? Based on the investigation, we believe that might be one of the persons. 
as police also conducted investigation and made checks at the residence and on a vehicle where possible blood trails were observed, hence the reason he was detained. Her husband, David Gonzalez, was later charged for the crime and her young daughter was left without both her parents. 31-year-old American national Ariana Jones was also a domestic violence casualty. Jones had moved to Cayo and made Belize her home. She married and later divorced a Belizean man and then began dating another. But none of her friends could have guessed her new boyfriend, 23-year-old Javan Moody, would be responsible for her death. At least until that night in February when they were heard arguing in Jones's apartment. They said that they were upstairs having a talk with each other and um, they heard a, f a noise and he says it sounded horrible. But that when he said shush and he tried to hear the sound, that it cut off right then. So he didn't hear anything else. And then that her vehicle drove off shortly right after because he would have felt a way about it if the vehicle didn't start and drive off. He thought that she, she left the house. But it was not her driving the vehicle because she had already been stabbed several times. Instead, Moody drove to the police station, completely ignoring the hospital right next door. He told police he found Jones dead, but later officers discovered his bloody clothes that he tried to discard. Another woman who was viciously stabbed to death was 34-year-old Anita Pineda. She was killed on New Year's Day back in 2019 by her ex-common-law husband. Without any words, the ex, Ruben Casasola, grabbed her as she was going to a house party and stabbed her multiple times all in front of her mother. Her last words were for her mother to take care of her children. Pineda's brother said that the couple had a history of abuse. Every time when he, when he get drunk, that was a problem he makes. And, and then she had a lot of restraining out of against him, and then he no reach a yard, he no reach a back there. But How long uh, were they together? Let's see, how many years? <laughs> Couple of years, so make them have the three kids from nine, seven, and five. A lot of years. And throughout that relationship, he abused her, you'd say? From then, from then, when I knew he, he always got a problem with she, like, he always make issues. Another woman who left her husband after years of abuse was 41-year-old Geraldine Flowers. Flowers was at her Dangriga home, getting ready for work, when her ex, Rodwell Arzu, showed up and they got into an argument. Arzu fatally shot her and then turned the gun on her cousin, who was staying with her at the time. Reports are that Arzu felt jealous, believing that the cousin was Flowers' new partner. But her sister denied that claim and said that Flowers had faced years of abuse before getting the strength to leave for the sake of her kids. My sister, she experienced so many type of abuse. She tried to come out. She tried her best to get out of it. And just when she decided enough was enough, and she was not going to take him back, he decided if I can't have you, no one else will. And what makes me so angry is the fact that he was living with someone else. 30-year-old Josephine Hamilton faced a similar situation and tried to leave as well but her common law husband killed her before she got the chance. PCC Ferguson pulled out his firearm in November 2018 and fatally shot her in their PG home before turning the gun on himself, right in front of their children. What was the trigger for this horrible event? That like he wants to hurt her, ally, she was, he was telling her, he, she wants to tell me, like, oh, oh, since you want to push that kind of person, eh, all right, our life, I, 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 I like to say that that, that would happen yesterday night. I, I like to say that. He must, she must have one left at that time, or already popped, and he knew about it. Of course, these are only a few of the women who have been lost to domestic violence. And yet, there are so much more who are faced with abuse in their daily lives. Courtney Menzies, 7 News. Seven houses, one of the shelters in Belize where battered women can seek refuge. They can find out more from the Women's Department or the Police Domestic Violence Unit. This morning, the Belize Tourism Industry Association held its 35th annual general meeting. In this session, the board of the BTIA provided a detailed accounting to its membership about how bad the COVID-19 pandemic has hit the tourism industry. They also discussed a few of the short-term remedial steps they are taking to support BTIA members through what might be 
the biggest shock that Belize's tourism has ever faced. As with all mass gathering events, this AGM was held via Zoom teleconference. We joined in and here's what a few of the speakers had to say about the state of affairs in the industry at this time. Income statement, again, is showing a huge drop from 650, 651 to 370 thousand dollars almost three hundred thousand dollars uh, as a result of that drop it has affected every single facet of operation of the btia um, in terms of expenses and i'll go into that a little bit more but in terms of expenses well similarly we were able to reduce expenses and largely this had to do with cutting staff costs from march reducing initially at 75 then 50 percent um, terminating staff and, and all those critical things, decisions that we had to make, decisions we did not enjoy doing, but we were forced to do. And as a result, you see the difference in, in expenses as well. So in, in essence, in essence, the BTIA income basically stopped at the end of March but the expenses did not stop. And as a result, BTAIA had to make some tough decisions. And um, one of our biggest costs obviously is staff. And um, I think it's okay for me to mention that all our staff have virtually been terminated. The last two members of staff are on, presently on notice up to the end of December. And um, that's our position right now. We are looking to, to bounce back with new strategies, new hopes, new approaches. Globally, tourism generates $3 trillion. And for Belize, over $1 billion. Globally, one in 10 jobs, one in Belize, one in four jobs. Globally, approximately $2 trillion in investments. And in Belize, that number is over 200 million. Globally, 10% of GDP, and in Belize, somewhere around 25% of GDP, directly and indirectly, up to 40%. The reality is, tourism is an economic juggernaut. My friends, we are truly living in an uncertain time, a time when many stakeholders are on the brink of losing everything, a time when the tourism industry has been shaken to the core Today, almost all stakeholders are struggling to keep afloat. Our tour guides, tour operators, restaurant owners, people who own gift shops, bars, attractions, small, medium, and large properties. No one has been spared the devastating blows of COVID. However, for all of you who are hurting badly, I can assure you that I've spoken to the Prime Minister and my colleagues in Cabinet and we are committed to doing whatever we can to ensure that our tourism industry has the support it needs to navigate through the COVID-19 minefields. Now that most international travel has been restricted due to COVID-19, our government wasted no time staging new policies to revitalize our tourism sector after containing the domestic spread. There's always a silver lining of every cloud. So we made our efforts to further improve the competitive edge of Taiwan's positioning in the international travel market. A Caribbean and Pacific region, tourism and agriculture producers, a products reception under the theme, visit secret land of the allied countries of the Caribbean and the Pacific region after the epidemic was held on November 5th in Taipei. A letter of intent to promote tourism was signed by the Taiwan Quality Assurances Association and the Police Tourism Industry Association. The purpose of the letter of intent is to promote mutual collaboration, exchange experiences, and share information in tourism. We will continue to increase the tourism in exposure rate with Taiwanese travel agencies, particularly showcasing the unparalleled beauty of Belize and bridging with the outstanding tourism industry of Belize. Belize points itself with abundant and splendid wonders and beauties. Geographically close to North America, Belize has much greater potential 
than Taiwan to further develop your tourism industry and attract more worldwide tourists to discover this jewel of the crown. A new executive committee was also elected for the period 2021 to 2022. Stuart Crone is now the new president of the BTIA. Tamara Sniffen remains the first vice president. Osmani Salas is the second vice president. Reynaldo Guerrero stays on as treasurer and Tanya Silva will remain as secretary. Melanie Paz, the former president, has agreed to assist the new committee. And while the BTIA meets virtually in Belize, Prime Minister Johnny Briseño did so in New York. He gave his first UN address this morning. He spoke during a special and virtual General Assembly in which he made the case for small island developing states under the acronym SINCE. And in his first address, Briseño was focused on money matters, calling for an overhaul of the international financial system in a manner that he hopes will address the challenge of indebtedness that small countries like Belize have had to undertake just to get through the pandemic. We did what we could. We repurposed where possible and barred when we could ill afford it. But now the situation grows more urgent. The existing resources in SIDS are about to dry up and the debtors are waiting by the door. We therefore continue to call for an overhaul of the international financial system to address our challenges of indebtedness, limited fiscal space, and vulnerability to market volatility. To have emerged out of this pandemic without tangible changes to the international financial system to enable vulnerable countries access to resources they so desperately need would be a complete loss. This is a critical moment to galvanize our commitments to collective action so that the most vulnerable countries can catch our breath as our economies are choked by the socioeconomic impacts of this crisis. Prime Minister Bersenio also spoke in his capacity as chair of the Alliance of Small Island Development State, OAS. And we are a uh, break. We'll, sorry, we'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll tell you about yesterday's flash flood in the city. Are backed up by drains? Are the backed up drains to blame? We ask City Hall. Don't go away. Mm. Beer of Belize. <gasps> Ray, what's wrong? It's him. He hit me again. Oh my gosh. This time it was worse. He slammed my face in the wall and threatened to kill me. If you or someone you know is experiencing family violence, call 0800 for way out. Or you can text or WhatsApp to 672 9628. This message is brought to you by the National Women's Commission, funding from Be Engender and Spotlight Projects. Have you been a victim of gender-based violence and were dissatisfied with the service received from the department you visited? The National Women's Commission developed a complaint form which addresses the concerns of victims of gender-based violence who felt that they were not treated professionally by the police, healthcare professionals, social service institutions, or other relevant sectors. The form is filled out by the victim or another person on his or her behalf. The form should be placed in the box provided at the designated office in your district. 
These forms are self-addressed, so they can also be folded, stapled, and mailed to the address on the form, free of cost, by any post office countrywide. Your information will be held in the strictest confidence. You will be able to fill out the form online, which will be on the National Women's Commission website. After the form has been sent, an internal investigation will be conducted by the relevant department, and you will be notified of the changes made as a result of your complaint. The victim's complaint mechanism will be rolled out in all districts. This message is brought to you by the National Women's Commission, with funding from Engender and Spotlight Projects, and support from the Department of Youth Services. Contraband is the illegal importation of goods such as alcohol, tobacco, foods, and parts. Apart from breaking the law, smugglers are also now endangering the health of all Belizeans. They risk bringing coronavirus into Belize with their contraband. To keep COVID-19 out of Belize, everyone entering the country is screened and quarantined. But contraband smugglers are not using legal entry points and are bypassing all safety measures. And these same smugglers are moving among the population. They could be carrying the virus. By coming into the country illegally, they could cause outbreaks of COVID-19. Buying or smuggling contraband is putting yourself, your family, and the entire country at risk. Report smuggling. For SMART, call 0800-JUMPERS or 0800-BORDERS. For Digi, 0800-SAVE-BZE. This message is brought to you by the Belize Police Department and the Belize Bank. productos como el alcohol, tabaco, comida y objetos. Aparte de romper la ley, los contrabandistas están poniendo ahora en riesgo la salud de los beliceños. Ellos arriesgan traer coronavirus a Belice por medio de sus contrabandos. Para mantener el COVID-19 fuera de Belice, todos los que entren al país son examinados y encuarentenados. Sin embargo, los contrabandistas no utilizan los puntos de entrada legal y se saltan todas las medidas de seguridad. Estos mismos traficantes se están moviendo entre la población. Ellos podrían tener el virus. Al entrar ilícitamente al país, esto puede provocar un brote de COVID-19. Comprar o traficar contrabando te pone a ti, a tu familia y a todo tu país en riesgo. Para números de SMART, llama al 0800-586-7377. 0800-586-7377. Y para Digi, 0800-728-3293 para reportar cualquier actividad de contrabando. Este mensaje es presentado por el Departamento de Policía de Belice y el Banco de Belice.
Back in August, we told you about Corporal Elton Eligio, a.k.a. Supercop. He's the officer who was charged with possession of a firearm while under the influence, failure to produce a firearm license and driving a motor vehicle without due care and attention. He'd also faced previous charges for a flurry of traffic offenses in a fatal accident, including manslaughter by negligence, causing death by careless conduct, driving without a valid driver's license, driving an unlicensed motor vehicle, negligent, grievous harm, and failing to provide a specimen for testing. Tonight, we can report that Eligio has walked off of his most recent charges. It's all thanks to his attorney, Dickie Bradley, who today asked the court for more time to receive what he calls the most important piece of evidence in Eligio's case. That evidence is Eligio's urine sample, which Bradley claims is currently unavailable, while the forensic officer responsible remains in quarantine. When we spoke to him today, Bradley today told us that being drunk with a firearm is a dangerous thing indeed being that the firearm is already drunk the minute it's loaded. In August of this year, police officer Elijo was detained, arrested and charged the same day that he had his licensed firearm and one of the police said he smelled alcohol and charged him which is, it is an offense. I want everybody who have a licensed firearm to know it is illegal, it is a criminal offense. Bail will be denied to you and you face imprisonment if you drunk and have your gun. If your alcohol level is above a certain amount that the law doesn't allow, you are committing an offense. It's a dangerous thing to be drunk with a firearm. He was charged for two offenses. Today was a day when disclosure should have been presented so that the magistrate could start the trial. August to September, October, November, it is December. This officer is on half pay. There was a big media coverage for him, like he's some criminal. Well, you were in court and you heard what transpired. The prosecutor asked for time this morning to go and try to salvage whatever it is. The law that governs it is that whatever is in the investigation file, if you don't have everything, give it to the person. He's accused of a very serious offense. They could not present anything in court this morning. I know the prosecutor came off COVID recently, but this has nothing to do with the prosecutor. The minute you charge a man for being under the influence of alcohol, the first thing you do is get the samples over to the lab and make sure you get it back on time. They don't have it. We were given what was in the file and it is insufficient for us to go through a trial. Nobody can come here and no police officer can tell the magistrate they smell rum and that means that you have committed an offense. So bottom line is we made a submission and pointed out that this can't be fair, man. The charges were dismissed and cannot likely be brought back. You've been hearing the rumors for weeks. Government assets, including equipment and furniture, sold off on the cheap. And perhaps most infamously, claims of Prados and other high-priced government vehicles sold off to former ministers and CEOs at fire sale prices. It was at the top of the agenda at the new government's first public service union meeting this morning. And it was at this meeting that the union was informed of the cabinet's decision to launch a full investigation into the sell-off of government assets by the previous administration. It's an investigation that the Public Service Union, as the arm of government that would have facilitated these transactions, has consented to join in on. Moving forward, the inquiry will also include representatives of the Ministry of Finance, the Attorney General's Ministry, the Ministry of the Public Service and the private sector. A man has been charged for shooting a trial farm resident four times on November 29th. Police arrested Austin Alexander Williams for the crime of attempted murder of the victim, Elroy Arnold. Reports were that two men went to buy weed from Arnold at his home, but then one of them pulled out a firearm and shot him in the chest, back and in both legs sometime after six that night. The incident may have been drug related or could be related to the fact that Arnold had gotten off a murder charge. Yesterday afternoon into the evening, Billy City residents were impacted when a sudden storm dumped five inches of rainfall 
over the central region of the country. Seven News understands that a cold front passed over Belize and after it regressed, it caused the downpour. After only a few hours, a few of the low-lying city's streets became flooded. The good news is that after the rain stopped, the water ran off just as quickly. Today, we asked the deputy mayor of Belize City if City Hall was keeping the drains clear enough to make sure water run off in a timely manner. Yeah, yesterday was a very good example of what we were expecting, but I don't think we were expecting so much water so quickly. Um, the streets were inundated. Uh, I, I took a tour during the, the storm and I noticed that water started building up around Vernon Street, the Pong Yard area, and some of the other areas that we were working on earlier. Uh, so what I did was I made sure I got my guys out to go out there, monitor the situation, and we were pleasantly surprised that by midnight last night, water was off the street. So it simply means that the remedial works that we've been doing, the, the infrastructure works that we've been doing with the drains are working. So I'm happy that um, the city was dry this morning. And I think the mayor called us out and said, good job, guys. But I just glad that the, the rains, the rains are held up a bit. No, sir, f for those residents who may have been expecting immediate uh, uh, relief through uh, draining is that a reasonable expectation well yes it's reasonable because what we did also we had the back hoe ho out digging certain drains that were clogged up like uh, for example in the antelope street antelope street area and i think we also went somewhere in uh, but not but would be coral grove sunray sundialka all of those streets were inundated as well but they were cleared quickly all the all the outlets we've been on on it ever since even before the hurricane season started when it was dry because we made sure that all the outlets were cleared uh, we noticed too that as soon as the outlets are cleared you know people have a tendency to you have to get rid of garbage but i would advise them instead of um, dumping the garbage just indiscriminately. Don't be afraid to give us a call at the council and we'll accommodate. We, we need to. And while the city's floods ran off quickly, communities across the country are still recovering from the flooding that inundated areas of the Belize and Kai districts. And as usual, Taiwan is there to assist in the recovery efforts. Yesterday, the ambassador Remus Lee Ku Chen presented a grant of 100,000 U.S. dollars to assist in the repairs of the damages caused by hurricanes Eta and Iota. The donation was received by Christopher Koi, Minister of State in the Ministry of Finance, Economic Development and Investment. Minister Koi said that the funds would be used for the emergency repair of infrastructure that was impacted by the floods. Flood damages have been estimated at $9 million and flood losses at $150 million. And the flooding would only have made it worse for an elderly Belize City woman living in the Lake Independence area. Tonight, she is resting a lot more comfortably in a new home which was donated by the Belize City Council. Mayor Bernard Wagner, he collaborated with several private sector partners to build a new home for Ori Mae Evans. For years, she had been living in a broken down wooden house that was overdue to fall at any moment. The mayor and his team happened to find out about her distress just in time, and with the help of several corporate citizens, a new home was built for her. Seven News attended the official handover today, and here's what the mayor and the recipient of this donation had to say. Again, collaborative effort um, on behalf of the city, uh, myself and the city council, um, the Belize Bank, um, Golden Bay, as well as Benes, Benes um, Home Depot and Angel Quarry. Um, walking in this area, I saw this elderly woman living in this deplorable condition and I, I, I said to myself I had to do something to improve her living conditions and was quick on the phone with, 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 with those relationships that I've developed over the years and and everyone came on board and today we have the end results. Brand new home valued at over twenty-four thousand dollars. Um that is that is what it cost us. But um and it's a well built home. 
Um, so we feel we feel very good about this project. We were able to get some of the materials through Benes and um, um, Golden Bay. Belize Bank did a monetary contribution to it as well, and um, Gel Quarry did the landfill. So when you look at what was here before, you can appreciate um, what has been achieved. Whenever time the rain, everything get wet up. When the bees blow, the house rock like rocking chair. So it makes you afraid to sleep in bad weather. So, and then I was getting tired of it because you can't sleep at night. You can't, you're afraid to sleep. You're afraid to do anything in the house because you're afraid even to walk, even to use the bathroom because you're afraid to drop through. So when he come, he examined the house and he said, I will chance to what I can do for you. So the next day he sent his men there and they examined the house. So when they come back, they said the house is done beyond repair. They have to take down the house. So he said, well, they come back and they tell them yeah, the house can repair, they need a new one. So about a week afterwards, well, they come and they start to take down the house. And here is where I am now. Did you expect that you would get such quick results? No, because as usual, everybody like promise and promise and promise. So I wasn't really looking out for it because too much promises are enough fulfill. So when I really see the action, I say, what? Are you getting the house? <laughs> and while the Belize City Council was able to provide the senior citizen with a new home to shelter her from the rains, they are currently struggling with their newly renovated downtown commercial center. You'll remember that final pre-election press conference that Prime Minister John Bresenio and PUP's Julia Sespat and Damon Courtney held in their last days as the opposition. Well, among other targets, they went after the Arguez brothers, Carlo and Daniel, the principals of international environments, an architecture and design firm. The head table alleged that this company has been the beneficiary of favoritism by the Barrow government. Espat even hinted out that the commercial center, which was renovated by international environments, was poorly done. Today, when we asked the mayor about City Hall's leaky roof, he said that the situation hasn't improved. It's just as advertised, just as advertised. We, we continue to have um, serious issues when it rains. Um, there, are, there are certain leakages. I believe um, the company that um, did the... The, the, the rehabilitation and construction have been in City Hall since then and has been, been um, putting together some measure of um, repairs. But clearly, you have a 3.4 million asset that, that, um, that you spend 3.4 million. We have a debt at the bank for, for 3 million plus, but it, it, it always takes you back to where you were before if you don't get value for money. But the Wagner administration has bigger money worries at this time. Belize City residents and businesses are suffering like everyone else under the COVID-induced financial crisis. And so the council isn't able to collect on all the taxes they needed to run the city's affairs. Today, the mayor engaged us in a frank conversation on the difficult financial times. covid had significant impact on our, our revenue stream. Um, what we used to collect, we are collecting the neighborhood of 40 to 50 percent. So it has been cut in half. Um, what we have had to do is to ensure that we that we prioritize and 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 with, with the mind that we we need to keep all our workers intact. That is that is a driving force behind our, our how, how we run the city. We do not want to add to the unemployment list. We have over 300 plus staff um, with families. We have dug in the trenches. We have hold, held the hands with our, our, our staff. Uh, um, we, we expect more from our collection um, staff that they are they are given um, they are given um, amounts that they need to, to bring in um, in respect to property tax. But again, you can't pressure the residents of the city. Um, everybody is going through hardship. And so we have to have some empathy, and that is what will get us through this COVID, empathy on each other. What kind of allowances have been made in terms of uh, taxes to, pay, to be paid to the city council from residents in terms of uh, having some of those, um, those taxes deferred? 
Yeah. And, and or um, offering some kind of um, incentives uh, for those who might have additional cash flow. Remember when COVID initially started, we, we did a um, we did a um, a campaign where we those individuals that rented um, market stalls, um, rented boots at the parks, we gave them a moratorium that they didn't have to pay any rent until September. So that was one way we assisted those small small business owners. We also did a 15% discount on all on all um, pro property taxes that again assisted many residents in the city now we have the business part the business component where there were many businesses who had already paid in trade license early 2020 and didn't have the opportunity to to do any business so what we'll be doing and we have applied through local government because we have to apply to local government that we give those individuals and those businesses a rebate or a credit on the 2021 trade license. So we are still awaiting the response from local government that was sent about a month ago. Um, and so once we get that, then we will know definitively all those businesses, what they will uh, be, uh, what relief will come their way. What have you seen in terms of the seasonality and um, the payments made towards property taxes um, in the city? That has dropped significantly. We, 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 have, we have in the neighborhood uh, um, over 4.5 million still out in property taxes. So that in itself is money out there, but we can't collect it. And we can't um, be in a position where we are taking any of those individuals to, to the court right now. It's about working out payment plans. It's about ensuring that, that those individuals have employment. Around this time, the the city tends to recoup yes. portions, huge portions of its revenue. What is December 2020 going to look like for you all? Not looking good. Um, not looking good um, the, the, in terms of the collection. When compared to previous year, it is, it is trickling in, but not to the level that we used to be able to, to, to um, pay back most of the, 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 the debt obligations that we would have incurred during the during the slow slow months but um we have to continue fight through this um going forward um, post covid any any uh, council will have to be be mindful of post covid and you will have to have steady leadership you will have to have leadership that understands how this economy works and how we could you could you you could um create that synergy and energy where people feel good about doing business again in the city and even after all the strain of constant crisis management the mayor told us that he will seek re-election for a second term in office here's what he had to say about his intention to run in the march 2021 municipal election i have indicated to the party that um that i'll be seeking re-election and so that has been um, forward to the to the executive committee. I know the executive committee will meet and decide the way forward. Um, it, it's a party that decides who 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 they want on their slate. And so um, I can only say that I want to run again. And um, and they will decide on slates. They will decide on candidates. All of that stuff. Were you were were the decision in your hand? Um, would you? go back with your CM team, or would you be open to having new councillor candidates um, on the ballot? Again, I cannot decide who come on my slate. Well, it's up to you, though. <laughs> I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> you think that the folks of Belize City, that you polled well with them for a possible re-election? Again, um, our work has been consistent throughout our three years. We worked from 2018, we have never stopped work. And so I believe at the end of the day, um, we do have some more work to do. Um, the streets are in, uh, and I will admit, uh, in poor conditions, but we know it, just like how you all know it, that we have to address um, some of the streets. But bear in mind that this council is operating on a 40% revenue stream so the residents have to appreciate that and have to have empathy it's 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 um having empathy on each other and realizing the circumstances covid 
is the real circumstances right now. Before you guys got into city council and even when you guys uh, got into city hall, there was this talk about building houses for uh, people in the impoverished parts of Belize City. Now, with today's partnership with the different business communities, you guys were able to give a needy family one house. The uh, municipal elections are some three months, four months away, and you guys still haven't made any headway in terms of those houses that you had promised. Building homes, as you, as you, as you may know, you know, fall under the mandate of the, uh, of the city. Right? Um, it was a good gesture and we, we, we still stand by it. We are still committed to building homes, but the, 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 the climate that we find ourselves in has, has changed everything. We have been managing this city. We'll be the only council that um, really run this, had a two-year term, in my view. Um, the third year has been crisis management. So you may have, everybody could have plans, um, Chief, but at the end of the day, it's the circumstances, it's, it's the immediate circumstances, and you have to be fluid enough to be able to change things. Maybe we wanted to build homes back then, but now it has to change to uh, ensuring that we keep our staff employed. Uh, there were some eyebrows raised earlier this week when the Commissioner of Police confirmed that he was planning a commander's conference for 50-plus officers at the Police Training Academy. This would appear to be in contravention of a strict limitation on social gathering. But the Commissioner said it would fall under workplace regulations which allow more than 10 persons to gather for work. But it seems he thought better of it and the meeting will be held instead via video conference, not in person surely saving the police hundreds of dollars in fuel and the possibility of a super spreader event. And while officers met on Zoom, we also spoke with former Chief Education Officer Carol Babb on that platform. As we told you yesterday, her five-year tenure came to an abrupt end after an internal memo written by CEO Diane Mejia announced her termination. Dr. Bab has been in the ministry for years, serving as the Deputy Chief Education Officer since 2008, before taking control of the reins. She has pioneered many projects, including the placement of financial literacy in the primary school curriculums, and has ensured that thousands of students are able to get scholarships yearly. She told us that she had been working on another project, ensuring that students get at least one healthy meal a day. But she won't be able to see that project to fruition, which she says is disappointing. Still, she has decided to keep her head high, even though she was only able to complete one year of her three-year contract. It's disappointing, but I also believe to Courtney that when one door is closed, many are open. Um, it's not the end. I think it's just a new chapter for me, a chapter where I will still continue to champion the rights of children will continue to ensure that children get quality education. Well, you know, you know, Courtney, I don't like to dwell on negativity. It is what it is, and I just want to move on. I just want the general public to know because there is a feeling out there that maybe my contract was hurriedly signed. My contract ended the seventh. Uh, the, the contract that I had ended the seventh of October, twenty nineteen. My new contract was renewed the 7th of October, 2019. My contract was for a total of three years. I have already done one year. I have two years pending. And I said, I don't want to dwell on negativity. I just want to move on. I want to find peace and I want to do the work that makes me happy. And that is to champion the rights of children. Dr. Bab says she will remain in the educational sector and has future projects lined up already. Child-friendly organization Belize Camping Experience is once again engaging in its annual Apple sales just in time for the Christmas season. This initiative raises funds to assist children and this year they say they're doing it a bit differently. Yes, uh, the update on the apples is that uh, we are doing again the project uh, with the apples for kids especially this year where we were planning to have to you know to have crops with the harvest for kids and the rain came and um, that was a very severe one there and so we felt even though with the COVID we felt we had to bring the apples in that way we can raise the support so that we can continue the whole work that we're doing with the children and the youth and the apples are 
coming next week. And we want to ask every Belizean to help us to buy these apples so that we can sell each box that is coming. Uh, the box of apples is going for $110 per the box. And we have the yellow and the red. And uh, you can make your order. And one of the things that we are doing better this year is to keep the apples on a cooling, cooling um, system. And Caribbean Chicken partner with us and they are giving us a cooling system where the apples will be stored so they do not lose their quality and on top of that they are helping us to distribute through the whole country so that every Belizean can pick up their boxes in the Caribbean chicken uh, wholesale and in that way we can get the apples going and we can continue selling them. By you purchasing a box of apples the proceeds go toward, toward summer camp so throughout the year we stay connected to our kids and we do our follow-ups and through summer we do our um, camps and you know like last year we couldn't do that so we did production we we put all our curriculum together and we made a production out of it and this year we hopefully we can have two of them because we could see the benefits for those that for those that use it that were out of the city for example those in Toledo those in Cayo so that kind of helped us spread the gospel a bit more to get your apples and support a worthy cause, you can call 614-3579. Last night, we told you about the successful military flight that the BDF's Captain Francis Usher, Captain C.R.D. Glenn, and Sergeant Gungara to Tonkontin International Airport in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. Based on another news report, we repeated that no BDF pilot had landed at this dangerous airport before. But that was incorrect, and we got a social media shout down on Facebook for it. Shortly after that story aired, viewers pointed out to us that several past military men, including retired Major Lloyd Jones, made that flight. We understand retired Colonel Gani Dorch also flew one of Belize's former prime ministers also to this airport. So we stand corrected. And that's all we have for you for tonight. Thanks for watching with your news. I'm Endura Craig. Remember that you can see your streaming video of this newscast at 7newsbelize.com. Brought to you by Digi for the best postpaid plans in the country. Remember now to wash your hands, to wear a mask at all times in public correctly, and to keep your social distance. Join us back here tomorrow at 6. And until then, have a great night.